John Trudell's a Lakota Sioux of some mixed heritage who came to my attention when he was the spokesperson for the occupation of Alcatraz in 1970, when the Native Americans took the island back after several hundred years of having only been used as a prison uh, and continued to be used for a prison uh, until they took it back and stayed there for about a year and a half. And Trudell became um, a really vibrant fixture in the Native American movement um, right prior to the Alcatraz uh, occupation, um, which was in 69, the American Indian movement, AIM, uh, started pretty much in, in Milwaukee with tribes that Chris could probably pull off the top of his head. Um, they uh, organized a uh, occupation of Wounded Knee. And that this month is the 50th anniversary of the occupation of the Wounded Knee site, which in 18, 1890 was the last significant massacre of Native American people by the US Army. And that the lessons from the Wounded Knee occupation in 1970, there's still people in, in jail for that, that, that fight then. Uh, but I had I had occasion to get to meet a number of the people that started the American Indian movement, and was invited to be a participant uh, as their in their representation in the Second World Conference Against Racism in 1983 in Geneva, Switzerland. The first conference uh, uh, was uh, you know, ten years earlier, but the second conference was boycotted by three nations. This is a conference on World Conference on Racism. There are 140 nations represented. And three nations boycotted it. South Africa, because they still had apartheid. Israel, because Zionism had been declared a form of racism by that conference. And the United States. And I had the rather unpleasant, uncomfortable, but terribly responsible uh, opportunity of being the only white male American at a World Conference on Racism. But I did have uh, a very wonderful and deep and rewarding experience in meeting a lot of these people. That, uh, well, there's some readings that went out there's some poetry by John Trudell. And the, the inspiration and the enthusiasm that came from that is hard to find in the rural South, no matter what you are, no matter whether you're a Native American or whether you're uh, an English-born lad who has some uh, great sensitivity for humanity. But that um, I do hope that you study a little bit about Trudell and the, his legacy, as well as the American Indian Movement. I want to bring up Chris Judge. Uh, who will take the program now. And Chris, of course, is um, our resident uh, associate director of the University of South Carolina Native American Center at Lancaster, uh, USC. Uh, Chris, come on up, take over. Thank you, Brent. It's good to be back here at the Majeska Simpkins School for the deep dive. Um, there are several things that we want to cover in the next hour. Uh, the first that I want, want to do is um, I've invited my friend uh, Terrence uh, Lillywater to come and tell us about the South Carolina Indian Affairs Commission, which is a nonprofit group that's been around now about 40 years, 1985, formed in 1985. And I wanted to talk about some contemporary issues that are facing uh, Native American communities nationwide, but in particular here in South Carolina. And I want to talk about a couple of programs. I don't know, more is one, and Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women is the second one. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I'd like to talk to you about today, and Hannah Bauer, who is one of the students in the class, and I are on something called the South Carolina, uh, or Indigenized South Carolina Task Force, trying to, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, bring Indigenous curriculum into K-12 social studies curriculum in South Carolina. It is woefully incomplete. It has been for a very long time. Uh, and uh, Hannah and I are working with uh, educators, uh, academics, and Native Americans, uh, gearing up for 2026 when they will redo those uh, standards. And, and our goal there is to see, Native American children want to be able to see themselves in the curriculum. And right now they can't they can't see themselves in the curriculum. African Americans have trouble seeing themselves in the curriculum. And then uh, towards the end, I want to talk about several bills that are in the legislature right now. One is to declare 
uh, Indigenous Peoples Day in October, uh, which was introduced by Senator Brad Hutto. And another one has to do with uh, giving Indigenous people in South Carolina hunting and fishing licenses for free, uh, tribal rights that they have had forever and should, should, should have back, and also the ability to use certain game animal parts in their art, which they've done for a really long time, but it's technically illegal to sell that art. It's, it's laws that are designed to protect game species in South Carolina. And so we wanna get, we wanna get that changed. So uh, with that said, um, Terrence, would you come up and tell us about the South Carolina Indian Affairs Committee? Tell us a little about yourself, the Indian Affairs Commission and uh, the programs that you think uh, all of us need to know about. Thank you. Well, um, thank you, Brett and Chris, for having me today, and thank y'all for being here. Um, my name is Terrence Louie Littlewater. I am Minikanju um, Band of Lakota. We don't use the word Sioux. Sioux is a French word. And there is some controversy about how that was applied to us at one time. But, pardon me, louder? You might put in the ceiling or picking it up. All right. There was some controversy at one time about how that was applied to us, but it kind of means little snake. Um, my family teaches this that the um, Canadian folks uh, right up above us, the Jibwe, and some other folks called us Nanawasu, which means cutthroat, because we were really, really mean traders. So it could have come from a shortened version of that. So we're not sure, but for the most part, we don't use it. Um, you were just talking about John Chudell. He's uh, a Santee, which is a um, Santee tribe, which is my sister tribe. There are um, seven tribes of the Chetty Sakoan, and that is what we call ourselves for the most part, is we are all of the Chetty Sakoan, even though there are seven bands of this particular group. And I know that's kind of confusing to folks, especially if you you know, if you've been hearing all your life about one thing, um, you find out it's a whole lot of things, but that's pretty much the way it is. Um, so South Carolina Indian Affairs Commission began in about 1984, 1985. Chief Blue at the time of the Catawba called everybody up and pulled them all together and said, you know what, I don't think we're gonna get anywhere if all the historical tribes in South Carolina don't band together and start working together. So that was their first agreement. That was called the Council of Chiefs, which still exists today. That is one of our committees. Um, we started out at the very beginning trying to establish two things, state recognition for tribes. At the time, Catawba didn't even have federal, federal recognition and a standalone Indian Affairs Commission. Um, it wasn't until we met with Governor Hodges at the time that we were able to actually get an ad hoc committee going with the Commission on Minority Affairs. Um, that was very tenuous. We had to get in a room and pound out uh, criteria for state recognition. Once that was done, there was a state recognition process. And so now we have nine state recognized tribes and one federal and some groups and what's called entities, which is a part of that law. Um, if you want to know the whole guts of that law, you can look it up on the internet. It's very easy to find. Um, but nevertheless, it was a very, very long process. And some of that process had to do with, well, how many Native Americans are in South Carolina? Where are they? Um, what are their histories, et cetera? So we went first to the state election commission because we had to prove we needed this. So we went to the state election commission and said, and I'll never forget this. We said, can we found, find out whether or not anybody's voting as a Native American person? And at the time, the commissioner for the state election commission said, no, <laughs> you can't because there is no box to check as a Native American on a driver's license when you go to get your driver's license. So how do we change that? So that took quite a while. So we literally had to start from scratch from the ground up. 
So now the state of South Carolina, I mean, Indian, I mean, excuse me, Indian Affairs Commission exists solely to give tribes complete autonomy in their decision-making processes. In other words, the state of South Carolina is not involved. No government entity is involved. We are able to be exactly what we are, tribes with our own governments that make their own decisions about what happens to us. And when I say us, I also mean that there are people in South Carolina who are tribal members of tribes in this state. There are people in South Carolina that we call intertribal members like myself. I'm a tribal member, not a tribe outside of this state. However, because I live here, I'm still a native person and I still deserve representation as a native person in South Carolina. So that's another thing that we make sure that we do. Um, and just also, I want to add that uh, my last name is Chikalamini, which is Little Water. Um, my family is a wounded knee survivor. If my maternal family had not taken the pass that they did into the Badlands, they were injured, they were starving. It was a pretty horrible thing. Um, I would not be here. So that is something that um, I don't mention very often because what I do, I tend to get a little emotional about it. And, um, but, you know, this is one of the reasons why talking about this and telling our own stories and having people that are our allies and listening to us is so important because we're still taking passes, literally. I mean, we're still creeping through Badlands because right now there's all different types of genocide that still exist. And, you know, we really need allies and we need folks like Chris, you know, is one of our allies and Brett is one of our allies that really help us walk through this. So that is something that's very important. So Chris mentioned that we have a committee called Idle No More. Um, Idle No More is our environmental committee. Pretty much I call it environmental committee. However, anything that has to do with issues that involve the land. Um, and that would be um, environmental justice, especially repatriation of human remains and artifacts. Um, they're extremely busy. Right now, they are working um, in Washington, D.C. with the National PFAS Coalition, and we have signed on quite, quite a few amicus briefs and are working, uh, have worked really to define the amount of PFAS allowed in your environment. In other words, how much plastic do you consume without knowing it? Um, in the water, you know, in, the, in, the, in what comes out of particular manufacturing plants, that kind of thing. Um, they're finding that it is actually in children's bloodstreams and does affect their cognitive ability. So this is something that's pretty darn important. Um, we have done eight surveys with the South Carolina School of Social Work on various things. And one of the most important things that we found um, recently is that we have a very high incident of liver cancer and kidney cancer in all of the tribes. And we have a miscarriage rate of 34%. That is over three times the national average. Why do we have a miscarriage rate of 34%? Right now, we're correlating where those incidents are and where particular environmental issues might be located to see if there's a correlation, but we do plan to get to the bottom of that. So that particular committee is extremely busy and absolutely vital. Um, the Indigenous Women's of South Alliance of South Carolina is one, another one of our committees. Um, they have done an amazing job. Uh, we did a, another survey uh, about violence. We're gonna talk about missing and murdered Indigenous women, which was mentioned here earlier. We did a specific uh, survey about violence and what we discovered is 84% of tribal women living in South Carolina were affected by sexual assault or domestic violence, 84%. And we defied, we de we defy statistics because most of the time those tribes, I mean, those crimes are perpetrated by someone who knows the victim. We are the exact opposite. It is by strangers and it is by non-natives. Um, so we have developed programs to try to help 
with this particular situation. Um, the first one being that we distribute, because we just didn't know what to do when this very first start, we got these statistics that were just so devastating. We put together what we call soft kits that are in every emergency room in every, every major hospital in South Carolina. Um, we had to meet with social workers for, with all the hospitals. We had to meet with social workers in tribal areas to find out the best way to do this. And they are kits that are culturally specific to Native American women so that they know that they are absolutely not alone when this very first happens, provided they go to the emergency room. Um, still working on educating um, the law enforcement and doing some other things with law enforcement. Um, the next thing we did was we were able to distribute, distribute ring cameras that were donated by Amazon um, to women who had already been um, domestic violence victims so that they would have some type of security around their homes. And then we have been able to offer six months of free therapy to women who, have, who are victims of trauma, and this includes human trafficking. Um, we also just did a survey on missing and murdered Indigenous women. We are having a summit on missing and murdered Indigenous women with the um, Lieutenant Governor's Office on Human Trafficking, um, SCAD VASA. Are you guys familiar with SCAD VASA, South Carolina Co Coalition um, Against um, Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault? And, um, and also some other experts in the area that can help us resolve this. I'm not gonna give you those statistics right now because we're gonna be releasing them May 5th, but all I can tell you is that we were, we cried. We knew it was a problem. We knew it existed. We had no idea how bad it actually was right here. Um, it's mostly upstate in the 95 corridor, which is exactly where tribes are located, a lot of tribes are located. Um, we also have a couple other committees, um, Active Duty and Veterans Association. That was pretty self-explanatory. It's where we provide assistance to Native American veterans and active duty folks in different ways. And we have a restorative justice committee. Restorative Just justice committee is ever growing. Um, it started out being called what we call the prison program, um, where we found out that prisoners were unable to practice their own spirituality in prisons. Um, and we, we would go to prisons and, prisons and talk to them and they would say, well, we have chaplains. I would say, no, we don't need chaplains. We're talking about something completely different. So what we did was we went from prison to prison and they all have different rules. Some are federal, some are county. It was very, very involved. And we made a way that we could actually bring persons in to meet with um, Native American incarcerated folks to help them practice their spirituality. Now it's just stretched out to be many, many different things. And this is a committee that we're working on right now because its expansion has become very, very fast and furious. So that gives you some idea of what we do. Um, that's some of our committees and programs. There's quite a few more. Um, and Chris mentioned some laws. We also wrote a state ICWA law, which is an Indian Child Welfare Act. Um, and the reason why this is so important is because we found mm -hmm that so many kids in this state were being put up for adoption in very unethical situations. Um, they're even being trafficked into the state because nobody here cares or knows. <clears throat> and we were having attorneys that weren't even asking if the child could possibly be Native American. So working with South Carolina Bar Association, working with the Children's Law Committee um, in the legislature, and we have a, um, Republican sponsor and a Democrat sponsor. So this is a bipartisan bill, but we are waiting for a Supreme Court case to go through called the Bracken case, where they're gonna make a decision on whether or not the Indian Child Welfare Act is based on race, which is ridiculous. It's based on sovereignty, not race. If you took a child from Texas, I mean, excuse me, if you took a child from Texas, that's one thing. If you took a child from Belgium or Italy, or Russia, or we sent Elian Gonzalez back to Cuba because he was a citizen. We are sovereign nations according to the constitution. You cannot take our children. So it's based on race. I don't know how this particular Supreme Court is going to interpret this. We're all very, very anxious because what happens with this is not just gonna determine what happens with this law in South Carolina. 
it's going to determine sovereignty rights, period. It is going to be like the first domino that falls, and then all the rest goes with it. So we're sitting on pins and needles. So I hope that gives you some idea of what we do. If you have any questions, you're more than welcome to ask me later. Um, but again, I appreciate being here. Go ahead and take the questions now. Well, you want me to? Yeah. Okay, I don't know how much time you have. So I... We got time. Um, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank, thank you for who you are and what you do in the world. And I really honor you and my heart aches for Oh, you. thank you. I, um, I'm all my life uh, as a white woman in wonder and no native um, um, heritage. I always wondered why they were missing, why you were missing. I grew up in Wisconsin where Chief Blackhawk was um, and his people were and were forced to leave. And so I just wondered why were there no monuments to the native people? So all my life I've been like in, you know, seeking restorative justice. And I've been working more recently with the uh, ICWA and with many, like the restoration of the native language and work out just wonder, my question, my question is this, are you working with ICWA across the country like with the Romero Institute and Lakota People's Law Project and Dan Shaheen and, and Chief Center and I mm -hmm. and Sarah Nelson and the people who are right up there fighting. Yes, we've signed on to their brief. Absolutely. The, the South Carolina Indian Affairs Commission is part of that brief. Um, and Chase Iron Eyes is somebody I've known, well, since he was a little boy. <laughs> I was an adult when he was a little boy. Um, so yeah, definitely. And I'm familiar with the Romero Institute and I'm a financial a sponsor of the Lakota Law Project, which is really helpful. I mean, even if it's $2 a month, because <laughs> they take on humongous cases that really do help everyone. It's a really good. That makes my heart hopeful. Well, if we have the most, the, if we have the best strategist possible in this country, looking for what's good and right and true, then that gives me hope. Well, they're not the only ones. I mean, you know, you have to definitely look at the Echo Hawk family and um, the Native American Rights Fund and quite a few other people. I mean, there are so many activists out there right now. And, and the younger ones are absolutely amazing. I mean, it's, for a while, like you said, there was an erasure, but I'm I'm seeing a lot of very, very loud, very passionate voices in the last decade. So it's pretty amazing. Yeah, and I'm I'm like the auntie now. I'm the old person. <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of cool to watch you know, watch what they do. We have a online uh, hand raised by Randall Reed. Randall, if you want to go ahead and ask your question, please. Yeah, um, my experience with uh, Native Americans was when I was on the Florida Folklife Council and worked extensively with the Florida Seminole tribe. And I made every kind of social faux pas uh, there could possibly be in dealing with James Billy and the other leaders of that tribe. Uh, so I'm asking you a rather guarded question, which is, in terms of this, <clears throat> excuse me, South Carolina Commission, what sort of participation do the Native Americans want from non-Native Americans? I think that's a really, really good question, and I, I'm good. I'm good. This is this is. I'm saying this in a joking manner. It's easy to make every faux pas around the bellies. Mm. So I don't think you should be worried about mm. that. Um, they're they're really fun guys, but they're tough to get to know. Um, how do you ally? That's a very very simple thing, and that's don't speak for us, don't speak over us, and take let us take the lead. In other words, let us decide what is important, and then ask us how can we ally with you to help you accomplish this. I think that those three things, does that help? I don't know where you went. 
Yeah, yeah that helps. Um, maybe the, the question could be reframed as what sort of support would be acceptable? I can tell you this, every um, tribe and every organization that works on behalf of Native people needs some kind of help. And I would ask them what kind of help they want. In mm -hmm. other words, don't just go out and assume, ask. Mm -hmm. So if you were to email me and ask me, um, I don't know more is a committee that also accepts allies. In other words, you don't have to be a tribal person to be on this committee. So that is one of the ways that you can help because they are so, so busy. Um, we always, I always tell people, please don't come running when there's, um, please don't come running when there is a front line. In other words, Standing Rock happened and everybody came running. Mm -hmm. Oh, isn't that cool? I want to go out there and fight with us. And uh, no, you don't. I promise you, you really don't. Um, thank you for doing that. But it's a lot harder than it looks. And I think people found that out. Don't wait until there's a second, I mean, till, until there's a front line. Um, everybody wants to do the cool stuff. Well, we need help with the boring stuff, grant writing, accounting, um, social media management, just kind of the normal things that, you know, like I said, it's the boring stuff. Typing, you know, keying things. Um, if you want some of my work, I'd be happy to give you. <laughs> I'd be happy to give you some of it so I don't have to be up until 2 a.m. But, um, you know, I can promise you, if you're going to help, it's not going to be just the, the cool stuff of, like, I want to go stand with Native Americans while they're dressed like in their regalia. And it's it's that picture that I want, you know, to take with, you know, me with them or that kind of thing. Um, and our issues are tough. And they're really difficult to deal with, um, you know, like distributing the um, the soft projects to hospitals all over the state of South Carolina. We really could have used help and some gas money, you know. So there are ways you can help. You just need to ask. It's going to be boring. <laughs> and the commission is a 501c3, which means that donations are tax deductible. Absolutely. Yes. I just kind of got the impression maybe he wanted to be physically involved. People yeah. just, he wanted to be like physically involved. Which no, 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 no. Um, um, I wonder if that helped at all. I, I can so see to, to, to things like uh, um, Randall, you need to unmute. Oh, Lord. Uh, how about that? I got Kim. Kim, I got a hand. Um, I, I, I was looking to. I think go, everybody's probably familiar with Standing Rock, but you, could you kind of briefly discuss the implications of that uh, South Carolina involvement in that, and what it might uh, imply for us in the future in similar kind of actions? Sure. Uh, boy, that's a. That's a big one, but um, it is something that everybody should be concerned about. I don't know what you saw on the news. I don't know what, I wasn't here at the time. So I don't know what was being presented here. Um, I do know what uh, I saw on the internet that a lot of people were saying. And I do know that what we were being told in camp was being presented was a different thing that was being put out there to the public than what we were doing. Um, the reason, that Standing Rock happened is because um, the Coda Access Pipeline, which is um, a partner of trans, I don't know why I just lost that word. Energy Transfer Partners. Thank you, Energy Transfer Partners. You, energy transfer partners. I started yeah. to say TransUnion. I'm thinking, why am yeah. I thinking that? Get me. Um, energy Transfer Partners. Yeah. Um, wanted to build um, across and under the Missouri River um, and that would have been a huge pipeline that would have gone directly over, would have gone under the Missouri River, but it was directly over what's called the Oglala Aquifer, which contains 30% of this country's drinking water. That's a third of your water. And of course, I can tell you, oil pipes don't break, oil lines don't break, my ass. 
they break all the time. You just don't see it. If you if you look for it, you'll find it. Once in a while, they'll publish something about a, you know something breaking or there being a fault in it or whatever, but not nearly as much as it actually happens. So that was our biggest concern because to us, <clears throat> water is sacred. Um, Mini king Wuchoni means water is life. It got shortened during Standing Rock because it's very hard to yell Mini king Wuchoni over and over again. Mini Wuchoni was just very, very much easier. Uh, that kind of translates to water life, but it's the same thing. Um, water in and of itself is sacred. It is blood of the earth. So it is something that we are called upon to protect no matter what. Um, LaDonna Ballard um, called everyone together and said, how many people do you, if we call people up here, how many people do you think we can hold? So they started looking at certain unceded territories, land of her own um, that belonged to the Ocheti Sakoan, which I explained, um, that belonged to us. And so what they did was they put a call out ended up being over 10,000 Native people, 4,000 veterans. And at one point, I think camp almost swelled to about 30,000 people before it was over. Um, and I don't know if you, you can, you can look at YouTube and you can see a lot about what actually happened. I don't think they showed the dogs that they sent after us. I don't think they showed the concussion because of grenades, I don't think they showed the freezing water that knocked us down. Um, I don't think they showed them trapping us on a bridge that we couldn't get off. Um, I had come home right before then um, because I had a sick relative here and um, I was just in absolute horror about what was happening near the end. And I think one of the biggest rumors that I really hated was it said that we left camp um, a littered mess. I have actual, I still have it on my, on, on my, I still have it on my phone because I'm forced to pull it out and show people all the time where uh, Chief Archambault sent in garbage trucks where everything was cleaned and hauled off by about 30 garbage trucks. The, the, uh, and they were huge. They weren't small. They were humongous trucks. Um, and it wasn't trash. It was, a lot of it was donated. And we weren't even able to go through all the donations before they made us leave. Um, and so that was a huge standoff. And President Obama was in Singapore. And he had been outside the United States. And some foreign reporter said, what? He, he, they asked him, I'm not quoting, what do you think about everything that's going on with the Native Americans in the United States? He started to give a general answer. And then he said, she, she said, no, no, uh, at the Standing Rock Reservation. And he said, I don't know anything about it. And so he came back. And as soon as he came back, what he did was he had, um, he went through the Department of Energy. The, it, it was three different departments. And he used regulations from three of them to stop the entire thing. And one was until an environmental study was done because um, trans uh, trans sorry, energy transfer for partners had begun to um, had begun had begun to dig and had begun begun to do work without without a permit. They didn't have a permit. There was no permit. They were there illegally, and they were on our land illegally. Um, one day after they it had they had been informed that they were getting ready to plow through um, burial grounds and place where that was very, very significant to us, um, we actually had to go out and stop them. And I think that was the first of people putting themselves in front of bulldozers and then pulling the dogs out and, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and their security was actually part of Blackwater. And I don't know if you know how vicious Blackwater security is, but they were, they were terrifying. I mean, they had hel helicopters with snipers. Um, and we had children on horseback. I mean, we had our children with us. So it was a very tenuous situation. And fortunately, President Obama did put a halt to it. What was going to happen after that, I, I can't begin to know because of course we had an election and then the next president rescinded all of it. Mm -hmm. 
So that pipeline is still being built. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so if we go back and talk about missing and murdered indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit people also, we know that oil main camps, they talk about, oh, this provides jobs, oh, provides people that kill us. Mm -hmm. um, what happens is, I mean, I have pictures of, it could have been three days after President Trump signed that particular, well, an executive order, it was something different, but after that was signed, there were 600 trailers abutting our land. Two days, that's how long it took. And where those camps are, are where our women disappeared. Mm -hmm. Wherever those camps are, there's a correlation between so many women and girls disappearing. So we know that this is a, a problem. So that's another reason why we don't want oil and gas industries anywhere around us. Yes, ma'am. I was gonna ask if you know if there's anything similar happening with the Willow Project, like if there's gonna be any kind of like protest or action, because I know that's, there's been a lot of like talk about similar things with like the camps and like how it's like right next to- I have not seen anything organized yet. But like probably, yeah. Um, I don't know if the, I don't, I'm looking at this myself because of what happened to us mm -hmm. and being just PTSD. I mean, it just, yeah, yeah. yeah. We all have it right yeah. now. Um, do, do we think it's better to go about this? Can we find some way to do this judicially? Can we find some way, can we find some other way than putting our literal bodies and our on children's line. bodies on the line here? Who knows, but that might be what it takes. Right now, I can honestly say I don't know because the organization just isn't there. We've got too many people talking about different things and we're going to have to come together and decide what it is we're going to do. I know that's not a good explanation. No, it's, it's fine. Just, I was just wondering. It's a good I know it's question. Like, yeah, it just, like, just happened. I mean, he like just approved it. So I was just wondering if you'd heard anything, but. Very disappointing. Yes, very I agree. disappointing. <laughs> And disappointed for not just us that live in that area. I mean, it's not, it's never just us, you know, it's, it's all the other people that live in that area. It's really horrible. Same thing with, you know, the pipelines that go through Appalachia and places like that. It's always lower socioeconomic folks who can't, don't have a homeowners association or a city municipal government that votes and says, no, we don't want that pipeline running under our house. And even just for people I know like my age, we're worried about like the kind of world we're going to inherit or like what our futures look like. So even that too. Oh, I agree. But I'm glad that you're concerned about it. I'm <laughs> glad you're aware about it because that speaks so, so well of your generation. So yeah, that's wonderful. Did I, did it, did I explain anything about everything about standing for? I mean, that was yeah, a very it, short it, explanation. And that's just, that was my experience. So I can't really speak for everybody. Thank you so much, Terrence. Um, next up, I'd like to introduce my friend Hannah Bauer. I met her um, a few years back. She was the Native American Affairs Coordinator Assistant for the Commission for Minority Affairs. And as I said, we're both, both working with a group called Indigenized South Carolina uh, Task Force to bring uh, K-12 uh, curriculum, social studies curriculum into the modern era and, and include Native Americans. So Hannah, will you tell us a bit about that project? Hi, hey, I'll just talk briefly. Chris put me on the spot, so. <laughs> I did not know I was going to be saying anything, but um, so I work with Indigenized SC. I work with our social media team and I'm on like the board. Um, and so our mission is to improve Indigenous education in South Carolina. And we have a couple different things going on, but we can always use more help. Um, we've been in kind of a lull, just like a transfer of like leadership. But um, yeah, I mean, different as we all know like curriculum in the past like year or so has been hotly contested in different states so any kind of advocacy for like better education k through 12 is always a good thing and in south carolina it is severely lacking 
Um, many people across the state don't even know that there are indigenous people in South Carolina at all. So um, anything helps. And if you are interested in participating or you want to know more, um, I can give anyone the email to put in the chat um, and put you in contact with that group. But yeah, it's like a monthly meeting. Um, and like I said, any help is helpful. So <laughs> um, we have a another online question for Randall. And Randall, I'd like to apologize. There was a muting issue on our end, and that's why your second question a while back got lost in the shuffle. I'm totally outraged. Can you? <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I've made this same offer to Brett, uh, at my age, it's not like I'm, I'm super career oriented, but in another life, when I was living for 20 years in Florida, I had a publishing company and that publishing company, um, published and sold, uh, K, um, educational materials for Florida studies that was taught in fourth, eighth, and 11th grades. And uh, we had a lot of fun producing uh, a lot of good instructional material, including that of the um, indigenous, uh, current indigenous and historically indigenous tribes uh, and, and their outcomes in Florida. And I would like to offer my services to whoever is doing the curriculum project since uh, I'm allegedly a instructional designer by trade. Cool. And Brett has my information. Okay, um, yeah, and I'll make sure the email for that gets into the chat. Um, so if you just shoot us an email, I can pass that on to your this later. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Other questions for him? <clears throat> I did. Uh, yeah, a brief question. Um, are you working with uh, the South Carolina Education Association at all to uh, to help incorporate this uh, indigenous curricula into the state standards? And if not, do you um, if you're interested, there's a, a person named uh, Jan McCarthy, who is a former state president of the SCEA who lives in Irmo, who might be a uh, an excellent person to connect with for that purpose. Uh, I work for the National Education Association, and at the NEA level, we have um, a number of different governing caucuses, we call them. Um, Minority Affairs Caucus is one, but another is the, uh, the Native and Pacific Islander Caucus. And uh, this sounds right up that alley. And Jan from South Carolina, has been in the past the person who is uh, the best connection to that caucus, and uh, and if the SCEA doesn't have this on their radar, they probably should. Yeah, that would be amazing. Um, it's still pretty small, like our capacity. I mean, a lot of the people that are in it have like full time jobs, myself included. Um, so our capacity is like low sometimes. But anyone that we can get in touch with to like, you know, find other things that we can work on or get the word out, like that would be great. Yeah, so like I said, I'll make sure the email gets into the chat. So any information you have is deeply appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's great. That's really good. All right, moving on. Why do we celebrate Columbus Day in the, in the United States? Italians. We're miseducated. Misinformation, right? <laughs> We're mis misinformation. We're miseducated. It celebrates Italian. Does anybody know what happened in 1891 or why we do it? Something about some love affair in Italy. Well, in 1891, <laughs> 11 Sicilian immigrants were accused of killing the police chief of New Orleans. They were acquitted at trial, and the next day a mob lynched them. Where apparently we almost went to war with Italy. There was a thought we might go to war, and it was a concession for the lynching of these 11. And it was, they said, who are the famous Italians? They made a list. And they chose Columbus to celebrate. It was a very arbitrary kind of affair. Now, if you ask children who is Columbus, what answer do you get? He discovered America. Discovered. And maybe even in South Carolina that he discovered where we live, right? The United yeah. States. There's this conception that well, the Thales, he was the here. Natives, that's yeah. them. And of course, he was never here. Um, 
being Irish, St. Brendan was here much longer than Columbus. Uh, Leif Erikson was here. His father, the, Earth, the Red, was here on the continent. So there's a lot of people that actually beat him to the punch, including Native Americans by some maybe 15 or plus thousand years. So it's a very, it's a very strange, strange thing. Um, in recent years, a number of states, a number of cities have canceled Columbus Day and have adopted in its place Indigenous People Day. Uh, Hawaii and Oregon and uh, cities like Seattle and San Francisco, I believe, have all moved to that. Um, when the thought came here, uh, Mayor Benjamin removed the Columbus statue from Columbia after it got spray painted red a number mm -hmm. of times. Yeah. Okay. Um, but if, if you talk to Native American people in South Carolina, what you will hear is that they want this day erased. And we're very fortunate that uh, Brad, Senator Brad Hutto has introduced a bill uh, to make that second Monday in October, traditionally to celebrate another person to become Indigenous People Day. And what we're gonna need is a lot of people to write your representatives and write your senators as that bill moves to both. Oh, I have silence. Um, you have to go. <laughs> That's um, another question, how they can allocate. Yeah. yeah. And uh, if, if you're uncertain who it is, there's a wonderful tool. It's called Find My South Carolina Legislature. You just put in your address and it shows you all the people that are representing you in, in, the, in the legislature. It also provides with these really nice uh, web links. You can just fill in a comment box and shoot it to those legislators. You can cut and paste it, send them all the same one if you're busy. Uh, but we'd really like to see a lot of support for that as that moves. I don't think that has made it into subcommittee yet. Um, and that's Bill 590. We'll get that information out to everybody. Right. It probably won't be heard in here, which gives us a whole year. Yeah. This is the Hail Mary path. I'm so pleased yeah. that, that the Hutto is a progressive legislator from Orangeburg and wife's a pediatrician. And that um, it, what is I found so good about this was he, it doesn't say we're going to replace Christopher Columbus Day. It just says the set was the first Monday, what, what the second Monday, second Monday, Monday yeah. shall be known as Indigenous uh, Native Day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, who's going to oppose that, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if Italian Americans <laughs> want to still celebrate the other one, that's fine. So we, we will be tracking that, and mm -hmm. anybody wants to know, we'll have yeah. information out in a timely fashion, yeah. whether it be things that they can do to we coordinate with the Native peoples because. Yeah it should be them and their children yeah. up front. Yeah. But it is the kind of thing, it's gonna need grass, grassroots level support uh, to get through. There's not enough Native Americans. I think we're around 55,000 on the last census in South Carolina. So uh, there's not that many of them and we need, we're gonna need help to get that passed and hopefully we'll do that. Um, the other one involves- uh, Chris, you, you mentioned at last lesson about how Christopher went home. Would you please bring that up in case some people missed it? <laughs> and we've got people here tonight that are zooming that aren't in this year's Majestic School class. Yeah, so um, a lot of people don't know that Columbus made four voyages to what, what they determined was the New World uh, back in the uh, late 15th century. And um, on his third voyage, uh, he had been replaced as governor. And uh, when he came back, he argued with the person who replaced him and he went home and changed. Uh, he was able to get out of that. Uh, Current political leaders are also facing similar situations <laughs> in our country and then dodging the boat in a Teflon manner. Uh, but uh, it's not someone who historically until recent times was really revered for any deeds that he may have done. And so it's surprising that we still celebrate that one. And I have Italian American friends who argue with me over it, but uh, we need to celebrate Native Americans. Now, of course, November is National Native American Heritage Month, but it's weird just to have one month for Native Americans. But it is one time when we can uh, uh, focus in on that. So please support that bill. Please, please spread the word on it. Um, the other one is to give lifelong hunting and fishing licenses to Native Americans, uh, a right that they should have always had. Uh, and there's precedent for that in other parts of the country where they've gone to that. Uh, and then the second part of that, and I thought under Mark Sanford, a bill was signed that allowed turkey feathers to be made and used and sold in art, but that is also a part of that bill, uh, which is making its way through the house. Uh, and hopefully we can um, also provide support for that. I'll, I'll get those exact links to Brent, for Brent to, uh, to send out to all of us. 
Now for the deep dive, are there any other topics that you would like to discuss? I think we're we're running short on time for our one hour for tonight. Yes. Um, just a simple question about just the language and speak up, please, so people out there are um, video well. So restoring uh, restorative justice, including restoring the importance of teaching the language, teaching Lakota or teaching yeah. whatever the language is to their children and to us too, to everyone. The, the question for those who might not have heard. Um, from the audience here at the Grow was, what are we doing to restore the language? And unfortunately, many native languages do not survive. Um, the Catawba language does survive. Uh, there are not that many speakers of it. In 1962, the last native speaker of Catawba, fluent speaker of Catawba, went to his grave, having not taught his children or his grandchildren the language. And what they wanted to pass, they wanted to pass in the Jim Crow eras of of that time, post Jim Crow era, but the civil rights era of the time, they did not want to be identified as Indian. And so they hoped that they could kind of fly under the radar and pass. Um, the Catawbas are trying to revive that language. They know there's 10,000 words. They know what the words are and what they mean. The hard part is what do they sound like spoken and how do you, how do, you do that? And also they're trying to bring in um, modern words things in, in, in the old dictionary that, that don't last. Now, the Catawbas do not teach that language to outsiders, including other South Carolina tribes. So, the course of that language is gonna be, be very rough. I know right now, my colleague, uh, uh, Becky Garris, who is a spiritual leader of the Catawba, is working in a middle school where the Catawba kids go one day a week teaching them Catawba. There's been after after school programs for the Head Start kids on the reservation where they tell the Catawba tales, both in English and in Catawba, to try to get that started at a young age. When you're a sponge and you're, you have a much greater ability to learn languages. But for the most part, the South Carolina native languages have died. You want to you wanna weigh in on that? Sure. You need to come up here and talk, talk louder to the speaker, <laughs> speaker above you. I'm going I'm to let Terrence handle that question as well. Thanks. <laughs> that is a good question. Um, I'm going to begin first with your, I think your last question was that, you know, teaching it to, to others outside of tribes. Normally that's not done. And, and I'll tell you why. It's because it's an internalized language. Um, there are concepts that we can't teach. And I'll try to give you an example. My last name in English is Little Water. That's my mother's last name is Little Water. But if you translate it as best I could, I really should be calling myself something like Mud Puddle because it's about, it's a story. It's a very, very long story about how life emerges from a very, very small amount of water. And names are responsibilities. I am responsible for literally the sacredness of water. Mm -hmm. And that's just a very, very small part of it. So I cannot begin to teach what every single word and concept behind it would mean. So it's, I hate to use the word useless. I can't think of another one right now. That one sounds kind of impolite. But at the same time, it would be a bit useless for me to teach you my language because you wouldn't really understand it. You might be able to know what a chair or a table or something like that was, but otherwise, you know, what we're talking about and what someone else might think we're talking about are two very, very different things. I mean, how many people saw Dances with Wolves? Okay, that was a cute name, Dances with Wolves. The actual interpretation is Dances with a Big Coyote. And there's a reason for that because of the story of wolf. So I can't, <laughs> do you understand what I'm saying? It would be really, really hard to do. Did you, you try to ask? I was just going to say, would you call that like a closed practice for now? Like like passing the language down is like a closed practice. Yeah. It's a closed practice. There are a lot of things that we've had to make a closed practice because it gets bastardized and twisted into something that it is not. I even see this happen with tribe to tribe. We have a male and a female language. We have a language that women speak. We have a language that men speaks. And then all of a sudden I'm down here. People are using my language 
and men are speaking, women are speaking like men and vice versa. And, and we have different types of medicines and I, I can't explain all of this. Again, this is why we don't do this. Um, and so that's sort of your, that's the best I can do to answer that particular question. As far as language revitalization, I think that every single tribe is constantly hankering and pounding the streets for money um, and funding for language revitalization. Um, and you're talking, you were talking again about the Lakota Law Project. Um, we are trying to go back to the way it was when I was uh, younger. My dad was in the military, so of course this didn't happen to me. But um, in my family, particularly, there are different fa families where I'm from that believe different things, but um, you did not go to school and between nine and 12. Everybody caught up just fine, but you stayed home. English was not spoken in the home. You went to ceremony. You were raised like you were supposed to be raised as a tribal person in my tribe, um, like you would have always been raised, except for a few things, like you lived in a house and some other stuff. I mean, that's, you know, we can't change everything. Um, <laughs> that remained very, very traditional to stay at home until nine to 12. And then you went off to learn other things, depending on if you were a boy or a girl. Now you go to school. So um, that's something that was very, very important. So we're really looking at how that kind of immersion until nine or 12, that nothing is spoken other than our language in school, in the home. And of course, that's going to take teaching parents. Um, it, it's going to be a very, very long project, but it's doable. Very, very fortunate in my tribe that there are still quite a few very, very fluent speakers. Mm -hmm. um, although what we call old Lakota, I mean, sometimes we'll say, oh, he speaks old Lakota, or, you know, because they'll use words that are no longer being used or concepts that aren't, that have been lost. So we are trying to hang on to that as best we can. The language revitalization, revitalization is extremely important. Um, tribes in South Carolina, most of them have lost their language. I know the Wakama, I think they know a few words. They have found a few words that they were able to, um, to discern. I think one of the biggest problems that we have is um, linguistic studies that have been done that says um, certain tribes all came from each other. Um, and so they'll say, okay, there's a Suan language and there's a this language and there's a that language. And we completely disagree. So that they, the way that, that you know, other people want outside of us want us to do this, if they give us money, it's something we don't want to do. So that's a problem. It's just, um, it is a huge issue. And, and I don't know how to answer that. There's 700, almost 700 federally recognized tribes in the United States, and they're all going at this different, they have different levels of funding and resources that they're able to get their hands on. Um, I work with a company that um, provides technical assistance to tribes that receive the child care and development fund across the country. And a lot of like language revitalization programs happen through tribal child care. So yeah, that's like absolutely the, correct. Yeah, like a lot of federal money goes to different tribes and then they can determine how to use it. And so like Head Start programs or child care programs will infuse culture or language revitalization um, and use that money to do it. But the problem in South Carolina is that state recognized tribes are usually written out of grants like that. Like grant funding at the federal level only goes to federal tribes and not the state tribes. So um, that's also part of the problem is like a lot of tribes in South Carolina who are state recognized don't get the same kind of funding that federal tribes get. Like I used to work with state tribes and now I work with federal tribes and it like, obviously there's still a lot of problems and a lot of like, but it, it blows my mind the capacity that some of these tribes have compared to some of the state tribes in South Carolina because it's so different and so much less funding. Well, we have tribes in South Carolina that are petitioning for, for federal recognition right. and she's absolutely correct. Unfortunately, that process can sometimes take 50 years. Yeah, it takes a long time. It's and it's expensive. Really hard. It's hard on the East Coast, especially too, or and in the yeah. Southeast, yeah, for a lot of reasons. Because you have to prove from first contact so my tribe, first contact was 200 years later. We had newspapers and all kinds of things where it could be recorded, you know, you know, contact with my tribe and what happened and, you know, the Indian Wars and et cetera. Here, when you think about it, it's really hard to prove. And I grabbed onto something that Chris presented when he was talking about, you know, the Congaree in a presentation that I watched him 
um, do. And he had found some things that I think that'd be really, really beneficial as far as first contact goes that, that might be helpful. And I went right back to everybody with that. So I think at some point when the time comes, they're going to be approaching you. Did I did I answer that? Yes. Is that cool? Yeah. All right. I did not mean to ask a, a Cecil, question. Cecil. <laughs> Cecil. Thank you, Brett. I um uh, this last note about recognition reminds me, uh, I moved to South Carolina only 20 years ago. And uh, for the last several years, I lived in North Carolina before coming down here. I worked at the state legislature and recall the um, the difficulty that the Lumbee had in North Carolina with uh, with getting legis uh, with getting recognition. And, um, and what I understood from representatives of the Lumbee in that state was that uh, for reasons that I did not then and have never still understood, there was um, pushback, opposition by other tribes in North Carolina against the Lumbee receiving yeah. federal recognition. I won't ask you to comment on that unless you really want to. My real question had to do with terms. Um, I'm glad that, um, that someone brought up, Chris discussed uh, Columbus and the way that in America, we're, we're taught, we're mistaught about uh, Columbus and, and the history there. And so it reinforced the question that I posted in chat earlier. As Native Americans were mislabeled Indian by explorers like Columbus seeking a trade route to India when they didn't get to India and therefore the, the indigenous people of this continent were not Indians, what is now the consensus view among indigenous communities today about the continued worse continued use of the word Indian rather than using a term like native or native tribes or indigenous, et cetera. And in application, for example, in practical application, the name, the title of the uh, the state commission, Terence, that you first described, the Indian Affairs Committee. Um, if if the word Indian is not, you know, kosher <laughs> among the indigenous communities today, then would not a more appropriate uh, title be the Native Tribal Affairs Committee? <laughs> and I and I really, really appreciate you asking that. That's that's a really, really good question. All right, so there's so many aspects to this. I have I have called myself an Indian all my life. My grandparents call themselves Indians. So everybody in my tribe calls themselves Indians. Um, it's something we're used to using. Um, and I think that that's hard for a lot of people to understand. There, one aspect of it is when you own, an, when you take ownership of a word, it doesn't hurt you anymore. Mm -hmm. In other words, we'll be fine. We can be Indians. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going to do it better than you ever thought we could, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so that that is one issue. Another one is that a lot of people say that, that Columbus thought he was in India or we were Indians. And that's why I call these Indians. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, but all of my research and all the people that I have talked to about this have told me that his journals reflect nothing of the sort. That he actually called us in Latin, if I make sure I get this correctly, Una Jede Indios, Indios, which is like the gentle people of God or something of that sort, because we were so easily, we were so docile. He thought we were so docile. What he was talking about was how easy it was going to be for him to enslave us, which he did. <laughs> um, and when I say us, I mean the, the, the indigenous people that he encountered. Um, but I include all indigenous people as you know my relatives, so that's what I'm going to say. So being called Indians, that as far as like we're from India or that was a mistake, um, I have found that not to be true, and that that doesn't so it doesn't particularly bother us. Um, I will say this though, as with most minority populations. You should call them uh, as a you know a non-indigenous person what they want you to call them, not what they maybe call themselves at home or anything of that sort. So if I were you, I would not use the word Indian. Um, I would use the term Native American, or we would prefer indigenous. And to be honest with you, we would give anything if you would call us by our tribal names. But how the heck are you going to know that? 
um, that's really, really difficult. Mm -hmm. The term Native American was even decided for us. We didn't even get to decide that. You know, that was during um, a time when everybody was trying to be what they want to call politically correct, with I just like to say maybe a little bit more polite and kind, um, decided to try to find something that would be more palatable for especially non-natives to call us. And, and it was done in not, it's done in a good way. And it's fine, you know, calling us Native American is absolutely fine, but I wouldn't use the word Indian otherwise. Um, so it's it's kind of a complicated thing, but it always is. I mean, they're, all of my answers are always complicated. I'm sorry. Sorry, I keep. No, also, but I feel like American Indian is also a term that's often used in laws to describe uh, different tribes. So, like when we talk about like federally recognized tribes in the United States and state recognized tribes, like the term American Indian is usually what's used. And so, I feel like some of the terms have like different scopes. Like Indigenous is more of like a global term, whereas like mm -hmm. American Indian is like a very spe specific like. United States. North America. Yes, yeah. yes. And um, so there's like legal implications, I think, to the different terms that are used. But like you said, it's obviously like best to use like, you know, the name of the tribe that somebody's from first and foremost, if you know it. And then like from there, something like native or just like, I don't know. Can we use the first people? I'm not the first bad. <laughs> first nation, first people. I mean, yeah, I mean that's fine, but that's a really good point that it, using the term Indian does have a lot of and laws. There's a lot of tribes here, like the state tribes here, a lot have like Indian in their name. They so do. like, yeah. it's not exactly. I mean, like if you're using the name of the tribe that they decided for themselves, like you're saying Indian. You know what I mean? So yeah. It's like yeah. I think I've seen it changing in the time that I've been at the Native American study, 17 years. I remember questioning Indian on a business card for a chief. And they said, well, we want to distinguish ourselves from Polynesians in Italy. and Italy. Mm -hmm. we're, we're in the lower 48, we're Indians. Um, and then I think, I think what I've seen lately is the move to indigenous. It seems like that's mm -hmm. a more acceptable term. But I think Terrence is right. You need to ask, what, do, what would you prefer to be called? Because yeah, I think I there's, a lot, there's a lot the of variation. Here. There's some diversity amongst the yeah. I use here. American Indian law because I deal with a lot of politics and law. So that's what the, the terms are and the laws I'm talking about or the political situations I'm talking about or whatever. It'll be American Indian. So I will have to use that. So, yeah. I work in editorial at my company and we use tribal to describe like the tribes that we work with, like the federally recognized tribes and then um, indigenous more broadly. Like if it's about people that are not necessarily part of like federally recognized tribes, but they're natives, like we use the word indigenous. So I don't know if that's mm -hmm. helpful, but like just from like a- Well, they could be Mexican indigenous or Central right. American indigenous. Again, it's more global. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a more inclusive, like broader term. So anyways, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's helpful. Just thought I would say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any other questions out there, Chris? Yeah, I have a question, if I may. Uh, yeah. I First of all, I apologize. I got caught up in some family politics and missed the bulk of the presentation. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. An observation and a, and, a, and a question, and I hope I'm not being redundant. Um, the observation is I, uh, I have a, a very good friend who uh, is from Virginia. She lived in, uh, she and her husband lived in Columbia for a number of years and moved back. And I forget the the, and I, I hate the word tribe uh, for a lot of reasons, but I'm going to use it just for illustrative reasons. Um, she uh, she is actually the chief of her of her tribe in Virginia, and she wrote a book. She did some history, and she actually uh, was able to get them. Uh, state recognized she wasn't able to get them federally recognized yet but state recognized and one of the things that she found among all the the native groups in that area in that part of virginia um that during the early part of the 20th century uh white anthropologists came by and told all the leaders of the tribe that they should not intermarry with black folk and it was her tribe that actually refused that dictate. And so uh, 
phenotypically, the people in, in, in her group basically uh, don't fit the so-called stereotypic look of, of what we think about with uh, Native Americans. Um, I, uh, if you could comment on that, um, she and she documented it very well. Uh, my other question, I, I noticed that um, in the title there was going to be some mention of Maroons, and I know in my research the uh, Catawba were known to uh, help uh, track down and destroy Maroon settlements, and I'd like, uh, if, if that hasn't been covered, I, uh, could you also uh, talk about that, please? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't speak for what's going on and what, what happened in Virginia. Um, I think I might actually know who you're talking about and what tribe you're speaking about. Um, I can only speak for myself as far as intermarriage goes. Um, my tribe considers all colors, all races sacred. This is why we intermarried into everybody. Um, that's not even a question with us. It's not even a concept that we don't even think about it. So if somebody were to tell us who we could or could not marry, and this would include two-spirit people, um, we would roll our eyes and tell you to F off. I mean, it just would not even make any sense to us. So like I said, I'm not, I'm not familiar with tribes, particular traditions and Virginia, I can't, I can't speak for every tribe in the United States. That would be absolutely unethical of me. Um, I can only speak for, for what I know. So um, maybe, I mean, it's possible they have the same particular um, belief system that, you know, most of us do about that particular thing. Um, as far as the Catawba and those actions, those particular actions, I have to say, I don't know anything about it. Um, maybe someone else could speak to that, but the people that could would be the Catawba. So they would be the people that you would want to talk to about that. Um, and in South Carolina, um, marriages between Native people and Black people were so common. Um, my father is the result of that. Um, it it's very interesting because the census in 19, was it 1923 was a particular census everybody loves to pull from, um, shows that there were just hardly any Native Americans in the United, I mean, in South Carolina, which is ridiculous because all the tribal communities still existed. They were still in the same place. They still had the same names. They were still the same families. So we didn't understand how in the world that could possibly happen. But after the Civil War, especially, either you were black or white. It became a black or white issue. It, it, there was nothing else in between. And I find that one of the difficulties that I have living in South Carolina is there's no concept here of being an interracial person, of being a mixed race person. I mean, nobody seems to, I love to go to New Orleans because I just, you know, I don't have to explain it to anybody. Um, here, it's just very, very strange that it, they look at you and that you're either white or you're not, period. And when you bring up, they say they didn't look like a typical, maybe Native American person. Mm -hmm. That really um, is an issue with me because I know that the media has a lot to do with this, is how we have been presented to people. I'm always asking people, well, what does a Native American look like? What do we look like? Um, you tell me what we look like. And I'll get a lot of different answers. And what you ask children is, of course, they're always going to tell you that we look the same and we look a certain way because of what they've seen on television. I can tell a Cherokee person from an Alaskan Native, from my tribe, from a tribe in Texas, to some Apache. Um, I can tell the difference between the Cayuga and New York by their facial features. We don't look alike at all. We are different colors. We are different shades. It is a very, very, um, it is a huge myth that we all look exactly alike. So 
that was probably a judgment that was made on someone's part that unfortunately was under the influence of thinking that we all look just alike and of course believe the same thing and that kind of stuff. I mean, they, like I said, there are almost 700 federally recognized tribes. There are hundreds of tribes that are not recognized, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we all have vastly distinct cultures. Culture is always plural. It is never the same. We are very, very different people. To that point, uh, my, I might add, this is interesting to me, and uh, pardon me if I seem ignorant. I think my grandmother, who is from North Carolina, belonged to the Tuscarora group. Uh, and uh, looking at a picture of her in her later age, she looks like the pictures that we have of Geronimo, she looks like Geronimo's twin. <laughs> well, Geronimo was a little tiny, and I mean tiny. Um, Apache. Um, and yeah. Very, very, I mean, facially. very, very beautiful man, no doubt, but very, very few people look like that particular, um, those particular people, the Chiricahua. Um, you'll see a lot of folks that live in Mexico that look like that, those particular people. Um, but the Tuscarora, um, they're extraordinary people. And I think that their particular lineage from what I understand from them, now I can't speak for them, is that it's very, very unique. They, they know exactly who they are. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I had a comment. Um, I'm sorry. I have a comment on one side of my family from North Carolina, the Lumbee. Mm -hmm. On the other side, on my father's side, they were considered Chickasaw. They were mixed with Chickasaw and other Native Americans in the Midwest. So I was born in Kansas. So there's been a lot of history. I just found out several years ago that we were Chickasaw. I mean, that we were Lumbee <laughs> on my mother's side. But we've been knowing, you know, about the Chickasaw, and, you know, on that side of the family. So I think that it was a lot of intermixing. My brother recently sent me a picture of my great grandmother's uh, brother and his wife was some native from the Midwest, you know. And he recently sent me a picture. He's like, "Well, who is that?" You know, and and they were they were natives from the Midwest. My family moved to the Midwest. He's fascinating, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't know that my dad was my dad's family was originally from Cape Fear, and they are now they're. There are members of my cousins and things like that are, are in the Lumbee tribe mm -hmm. that are registered with the Lumbee tribe. So I, I didn't know that until I was probably almost 40 years old. And I asked my dad, I said, why didn't you tell me? He said, well, your mom's the person that was supposed to raise you and tell you all this stuff. Yeah, we, he said he couldn't compete with that. So he never wanted to. My mother's ancestors have a Lumbee name, which is Brave Boy. So they eventually moved to the Yeah, town. that's a very, very, very common name. Very. That's a very common name in that part of the world. When we were little, my mother's mother died when she was little, and we were always looking for gray boys, and we never saw any until I moved to South Carolina. <laughs> and my brother got gray boy on his license plate, and he's like, why don't you get on your... I said, child, I could, wouldn't have a chance. <laughs> There's so many gray boys here. Definitely gray boys. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Very much so. Hannah, did you have a hand up I was just going to say that, like, I think one of the things that I've learned about state recognition in South Carolina and why it's like so difficult to become federally recognized is because like during the Jim Crow era, there's like well-documented cases of entire tribes in the Carolinas being erased through documentation because mm -hmm. like you said, it was like you were either white. It's like so it's called binary. documentational genocide. Right. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's also part of why there's been like so much intermarriage is because like during the Jim Crow era specifically, there was like, you were either one thing or you were the other. And a lot of like native people got lumped into, mm -hmm. they were open. You'll see a lot of the families that are, you know, native American tribes are listed as mulatto or free people of color. Right. Mm -hmm. And right. once you're legally listed like that, because of laws at the time, the only person you could marry would have been another mulatto, free person of color or a black person. You could not really marry a black person. So you're going to get a lot of that particular mixture. Um, and so you, you're going to have a lot of people say, 
it's like I even have people in my tribe say this and I correct them all the time that those Indians in the south or those Indians over there on the east coast they're all black and it's like honey <laughs> we didn't have a discussion because it's a it's it's a, and it's a modern myth and it's a very bad one very very damaging one from 1790 till 1900, Native Americans were not enumerated as such yes. as in most of the federal census. So that's such a long time to, to not be represented. And then prior to that being, you know, just a lot of times they, they write you down as white if you were phenotypically white or black if you were dark. It's called documentational genocide. Yeah, mm -hmm. paper genocide. Mm -hmm. Paper genocide, yeah. And so something that we're gonna have to do, and you ask me how you can ally, is um, we are having a summit on missing and murdered indigenous women on May the 5th. You can find out about that on the South Carolina Indian Affairs Commission's Facebook page. Um, but what we're gonna have to do is because of this documentational genocide stuff, um, county, municipal, and the state, SLED even, when there are incidents, when there are crimes either committed by us, and we'd also like to know how much of that is going on, um, or against us, there is, there's, it's only white, black, Hispanic, Asian, or other. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna have to literally, because of these incidents of, of missing and murdered indigenous women, girls, and two spirits in South Carolina, that is the next thing, that's, the, that's our next battle, that's our next front line here. Mm -hmm. So everybody says, how do we ally? Again, it's going to be boring, but because it's about paper. Mm -hmm. I mean, paper is important. We've literally got to have everything. And it's going to be, you're talking about them changing all of their paperwork, a county changing all of it, a municipality. And we've got to go one by one by one by one by one. And this is going to take a long time. So that is one way in the very near future that you can ally, and that would be very helpful. Got it. Thank y'all so much. Yeah, it's not You know, it's been so it's still happening on but we're not safe, so it's whatever that is better off. But I'm going to give Chris and Terrence a hand and see how you're happy to do on my journey. And him. And him. <laughs> yeah, of course. So the uh, one of the things that is of critical importance is the fact that there are Native people here in South Carolina. One of the reasons they're not as well known as they are in other places is they were killed pretty early in the game. And the word maroon came up and that we talked about that in the Majeska school, we're only going to mention it briefly here, is that there are people that ran away and lived in the swamp in the Congaree Swamp, in the Four Holes Swamp. And when I was at the university in 68 or 69, I can't remember, I found out that the native people in Ridgeville, South Carolina, were segregated from the, this is after, theoretically, after integration in South Carolina, and they integrated the white and the black kids into the high schools in, in that county, but left the native kids in a, three, in a, a school room with three teachers, none of them with college degrees. And so when they reached the, the ninth grade to go to the high school, they didn't finish. And so at that point in Ridgeville, there'd been no one that ever even graduated from high school that was in this unincorporated, unrecognized tribe that were, I believe, the remnants of the people that had hid out for a long time. And there was a sign in the local doctor's office, he didn't treat Indians. And I couldn't, I couldn't differentiate the young children as to who, which they were. The blonde ones looked to me be you know, regular like people that could go see the doctor. But that one of the things that happens as you get old enough is time shrinks. And all this looks so far away to people, especially when you're young. And I was listening to a podcast on public radio a couple of nights ago. And it was, it was about this painful time when the Native children were stolen and put in the, in the schools to assimilate them, to take the savage out of them and make them appreciate civilization. And I had the, the opportunity to visit uh, an Apache reservation in the middle of absolutely nowhere in Arizona that a friend of mine was working at. And um, they had that, what 
we've seen of all the way from Canada through the Midwest, these beautiful big brick buildings that the Catholics ran and that I, they were there and I saw them, they were using them there on the Apache reservation. And I thought that was over with. And listening to this thing the other night, it was interviewing people that acknowledged that the person they were talking to was, was had passed, but that he was in one of these schools and he was Lakota. So it would have been in the Dakotas. He was in one of these schools and they were, he was remembering when he was 12 years old in one of these schools. The same year I was 12 years old mm -hmm. in 1960 something, I was born in 48. And so that the, the time gets compressed when you start thinking about it. This like Majeska was born in 1899 and she died in 1992. And I knew her for the last nearly 20 years of her life. She was 15 when Robert Smalls died. I was like, well, wait a minute. I knew her and she could have known him. And so this, there's this sense of young people, especially I think in America, that don't have any roots. They don't have any conceptualization. They don't do what T talked about, about finding out who you are before you become somebody. And that we're now seeing a whole generation of people that are incensed about microaggressions and they think no one's ever done anything before. And so it is that loss of history, that loss of roots that benefits a society that's predatory and driven towards profit and doesn't have a soul, as John Trudell points out. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris, are you ready to do the wrap up music? Mm -hmm. I wanna ask if there's any more questions, but to make an observation that, that those of you that are in the school this, this semester, now uh, this tomorrow mm -hmm. is our next class. Uh, and as Dr. Green is gonna take up wrapping up the war of Northern aggression, we got up to the war last time, and we're going to start probably around Beaufort because Beaufort fell right in the beginning. And so there's incredible things that happened that literally impacted the outcome of the war and the development of relationships between black and white people since then that happened right here in South Carolina. So stay tuned. We'll see you tomorrow. Chris, take us home and thank you for coming. <laughs>